as uh, Pastor Rachel mentioned this morning, I will be mature in my vocabulary, but I will not be graphic. So just so you have that awareness, right? Today, uh, I am continuing in my series uh, on worthless things, the stuff that we're struggling with in our culture. Have you ever heard of planned obsolescence? You ever heard that phrase, planned obsolescence? It's where a product is designed with this artificially limited life. Uh, it's, it's not useful. You know, it, it becomes deliberately outdated. It's no longer functional after a specific period of time. It's kind of like bell bottoms. You know, it's like you bought those bell bottoms thinking, oh man, these are going to last. No, next week those are so out, right? Boho skirts, the girls, you know, oh, I got to get them, mom, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so, but sooner than we realize it, we have something in our hand that is of no good to us, right? It's the iPhones, right? The iPhone 8 just came out and the 10. So why did I get the eight, right? It's one of these moments, and as soon as you get it, oh, you need to update it. It's not good anymore. You have to do these updates in order to make it work. It's like, what are you doing, You're right? That's planned obsolescence. So much of our life is filled with and wasted on things we don't really need or want. Here's an example of some of the worthless things I see in life. This is an actual friend of a refrigerator. Who needs Twitter when I'm getting a glass of water? I'm telling you, I'm like, really? I need Pandora while I'm chicka chicka chicka. Oh, let's change the radio station. I'm like, what? Who? That's not, that is not Photoshopped. That's actually real. It's like, please get away from me, right? It's, here, here's worthless things. Here's more of these things. Somebody explain this to me. <laughs> now, listen, I, I, I've been born and raised in Southern California, and I know that's wrong. Okay, listen, galoshes with an open back is, that is worthless right there, okay? I'm like, something, somebody needs to like, okay, let's keep going. What, worthless things. <laughs> I, I am not Photoshop. This is real. You know, you need a hand, law says you need a handrail wherever there are stairs. <laughs> I, 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 right? It's like, who, who was doing this? More worthless things. It continues. This. <laughs> well, the dog needs a gate. We don't want the dog. You know, we need a gate for the dog. <laughs> gate. So what we need is a gate. And uh, now this one I'm going to find. A lot of you aren't going to get it, but let's see if you can get it. Let's see what you think about this. <laughs> now some people are still going, What? What's wrong with a golf ball? Okay, camouflage golf ball. <laughs> this is what they use on the East Coast, and right? they play in the snow, right? This, 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 there it is. You got to have this, because we have a white ball for our green grass. They have to have a green ball for their white, I don't know. I, I'm, why would somebody invent this? And it's, this is not photos. This is actual real stuff. Worthless. It, it means worthless is without profit, it's like, what's the point of that gate? Why would they put that railing there? I don't understand. Much uh, like these pictures, we have a lot of stuff in our life that's worthless. The Bible, however, connects worthless to those things that are either materially or morally false. They're promising something and then not delivering. In the book of Psalms, David wrote this about worthless things. He said this, Turn my eyes from worthless things. Grab me by the face and kind of right my stiff neck. Just get me to look at something else. He said, turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. This is where life is. And I, and I keep looking at things that are worthless. He goes on to explain how evil those things are. Well, I have adjusted this series today, this worthless things series uh, and last week I was dealing with distractions and boy, the conversations were very lively as the community groups got together and we're talking about, you know, I was talking, how many here last week? Last week, distractions, right? That conversation got people going like, whoo, you know, and then, and then they're talking about it in a group setting and the kids are like, well, mom, we watched that. Oh, oh man, it was, it was all lively. It was beautiful, right? Well, this week, uh, or actually next week, I'm going to be dealing with uh, the, the, what are words for? Taming the tongue. That's what we're going to talk about next week. But this week, I'm going to deal with sexual chaos, the deception of pornography. And again, I will not be graphic, but I will have some vocabulary, so you just need to be aware of it. Because uh, I have been enjoying this series so much, uh, I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying it, um, 
I've decided to re- retitle our Christmas series. We're going to do something different for Christmas series. Manger things. I don't know. Okay, no, no, okay. I'm kidding. I just did that for fun. I was, I'm, not, I'm not serious at all in any way, but I, it was a good idea. Okay. Uh, pornography, however, is something that is seriously worthless. And uh, it's everywhere. It's destroying our families. It's destroying our culture. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk, I want to talk about that this morning. Pornography, the word, comes from the Greek word pornographos. Porn is the, the Greek word for prostitute. Graphos is to make it graphic, to write about prostitution, to write about obscene things, to write about filthy things. And we've taken graph, right, that graphos, right? We've taken it to a whole new level. Now it includes pictures and movies and videos, and we've, we've gone all new levels with letting us visually see it, not just reading it anymore. It was originally just a small group of people. They would read about this filthy stuff, this literature about offensive behaviors, the obscene. And, and pornography, however, as I said, is just wrecking people's lives. It is taking selfishness to a whole new level. All new highs and lows. It's destroying marriages like never before. And so today, I'd like to fight against pornography together with you. I'd 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 like to explore this together. By by far, the most searched for terms on the interwebs are related to pornography. Pornography is rampant in the world today. 89%, 90% of the World Wide Web porn is produced in the United States. 90%. And 80% of that is produced in the San Fernando Valley. Did you hear what I just said? 90% of the the internet porn is made, 90% is made in the United States. And 80% of that is made in the valley just over those hills. It's real. Satan has succeeded in twisting and perverting sex through pornography. And I won't even begin to attempt to define what is embraced within the description of pornography, but we know it when we see it. 30,000 people every second are seeing pornography. Listen to what I said. 30,000 people every second are seeing it. And by the way, there is no such thing as softcore porn. It's like saying, well, it was only a little bit of heroin. I didn't, I didn't, t- I didn't take a, a full dose of heroin. I only had a half a dose of heroin. Well, it's cartoon porn, so it doesn't count. It's animated porn. There is no such thing as softcore porn. The enemy of our souls has taken what is good and right, loving, intimacy, and connection. Between sexual connection between a husband and a wife, and he's replaced it with lust, pornography, adultery, rape, and broken sexuality. I've got notes in your chair backs. I hope you'll take these with you. I've got a lot of scripture here for you. I believe God has a lot to say about pornography. We'll get into it this morning. I've got only a few blanks that you can fill in here, but I've got some stuff for you to take home. I hope that you'll take it home. Here's your first blank. Pornography is often the first step in a very slippery slope towards slavery. I'm going to use that word specifically, slavery. Everybody have those sheets? Make sure you get one. Pornography is the first step towards slavery. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. Listen to what, listen to what Paul writes. This is, he tells us about this. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. One thing led to another, which led to another, which led to another. And then he continues, now, now you got to give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you'll become holy. We've become sex slaves. And when the average age of initial exposure to pornography is 11, that's a lifetime of slavery. An entire lifetime the addictive and destructive nature of pornography is incredibly well documented. It's, it's, it is truly destroying us. I, I liken it to the warnings that we get on tobacco. Look at this, the side of a, side of a package of cigarettes. 
Smoking by pregnant women may result in fetal injury, premature birth, and low birth weight. And we continue to smoke. But, but that's not us. Well, I'm not pregnant. Watch these. These are all the warnings. Quit smoking. Quitting smoking now greatly reduces serious risks to your health. Cigarette smoke contains carbon monoxide. Smoking causes lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, may complicate pregnancy. Cigarette smoking will be hazardous to your health. Listen, the Surgeon General has determined that smoking is dangerous to your health. And we keep buying it. Two packs, please. A carton, please. It doesn't end here. Listen, don't, don't, don't end it here. More sugar, and we're closer to diabetes. We're gaining weight like never before. Fattest country on the planet. And we could put warning labels, and we do, on all the menus. They come with calories. Nobody wants to see it. <laughs> we look at it and go, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. I know this is not right for me. But we keep doing it. We're buying cigarettes. We're eating food we're not supposed to be eating. What if we put a label on pornography? What if it looked like this? This content will harm and addict your brain. It'll ruin your sex life, and it contributes to sex trafficking. Okay, I'd like to take two, please, and I'd like to pay for that online, because I don't want anybody to see me going into the store to get that, and I'll do it in the privacy of my own home. It doesn't stop. Even that little warning, 18, adults only. <laughs> By the time our kids are graduating from high school, listen to me, 100% of our kids have seen pornography. 100%. And you can take away their phones. Their friends have phones. I talked to a teacher recently who said kids were bringing pornography into their classroom because another teacher allowed it. He's, and the teacher's like, you can't bring that in here. My other teacher said I could. No, you can't. That's against rules. You can't have pornography in this class. My other teacher let us do it. Just as a drug user has to consume greater and more powerful quantities of drugs to achieve the same high, pornography drags a person deeper and deeper into more warped and perverted sexual addictions and ungodly desires. So, so you know, let me give you a perspective. They say that an addict consumes 11 hours a week. That's a little over an hour a day. And it doesn't, and don't imagine it's just an hour sitting on the computer. It's 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 20 minutes here, 10 minutes here, something on my phone while I'm sitting at a red light. This is what's happening. This is in your notes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to read to you 1 John 2, 16. 1 John 2.16, this is way in the back of your book, in the back of your Bible. You got three John books. We're just going to read out of the first one. 1 John 2.16. Listen to this. There, there are categories of sin. He says this: for the world offers only craving for physical pleasure. There's one. Craving for everything we see, there's two, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Here in your notes, it's the lust of the flesh. This is the way some of your translations even read it. The craving for physical pleasure, lust of flesh. The second one is the craving for everything we see, the lust of the eyes. And the third one is that pride in our achievements and possessions, the pride of life. Lust is... Is, it's just simply defined as envy. But what we're talking about here is sexual envy. Envy is jealously desiring something that doesn't belong to us. Sexual envy is jealously desiring something that doesn't belong to us. That's where pornography comes in. Pornography, obviously, is sexual envy after the flesh. And it's undeniably sexual envy of the eyes, right? But here's where the deception comes in. Pornography has convinced us with pride that we actually possess something or someone that we do not. And that's what makes it so incredibly heinous is it's firing on all the sin cylinders. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's pornography. If I could define pornography, that's it. Jesus was pretty clear in Matthew 5, 28. He said, lusting, sexual envy, after another person in our minds which is the essence of pornography, is offensive to God. He called it sin. 
What does the Bible say about pornography, though? Where does the Bible say, don't look at pornography? Don't engage with pornography. Where, where is that? You will find the answer in God's desire for our sexuality. Just, just find out what he says about our sexuality, and then you'll have the answer to pornography. The answer to our sexuality is, and it's all over the place, purity. And when we understand God's desires and compare that with pornography, it becomes quickly evident that they're not the same thing. Pornography has nothing to do with God's desires for us. God gave man and woman the joy of pleasure of sexual relations within the context of marriage. The Bible is abundantly clear about the importance of maintaining sexual purity within the boundaries of the union between husband and wife. That, that's what it was designed for. That's what the Bible says. That's not this church's belief. That's the Bible's belief. Therefore, it's the church's belief. And there are plenty of churches who don't believe that. Okay, this just isn't, I, this is what we're using. I, I've said it often. I will not pull up Reader's Digest. We won't read from that. I won't pull a magazine. This is what we're reading from. This is God's word. He, he said this about my life. The Bible is abundantly clear. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, here's what Paul says. A man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Humans are aware of this pleasing effect that this gift from God gives to us, but we've expanded it so far beyond the confines of marriage that we're putting into any circumstance. The secular world's philosophy of if it feels good, do it, pervades in so many cultures, especially in the West. Today, if you mention sexual purity, it's immediately labeled as archaic. Oh, come on, you don't really believe that. It's so unnecessary now. And in some circles, it's even considered hate speech. And yet, when I look at what God says about sexual purity, I go, ah, oh. well, watch this. First Thessalonians, come on with me to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses three through seven. God's will. I want to know what God's will is. What's God's will for my life? Here it is. God's will is for you to be holy. There. Now you know God's will. You wanted to know what, what does God want from me? He wants you to be holy. Yeah, but what does he want? He wants you to be holy. Doesn't he want me to be happy? No, he wants you to be holy. Watch this, though. He said, not only do I want you to be holy, he, he, he takes it, takes this, listen, it's so beautiful. He said, I want you to be holy, comma, so stay away from sexual sin. Then each of you will control his or her own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans, those who don't believe in God, those who don't believe a God exists, those that are not accountable to anybody other than themselves, pagans, not like a pagan. You're not gonna do that. He says, listen, that's not you. He says, don't harm and cheat a fellow believer in this matter, listen, by violating his wife. I'm gonna come back to this for a minute. For the Lord avenges all such sins, as we have solemnly warned you before, God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. This, uh, backslide, you went too far. There we go. Violating his wife. I I'll tell you what happened to me. I was in, uh, I was in youth group. My, my youth pastor had a saying, and he said this. <laughs> he said, when you're out on a date, you're with someone's mate. Be careful and kind, someone has to clean up the mess left behind. It was this little rhyming thing, you know, that I learned. I was like, <laughs> and it, it grabbed me because I thought, every time I'm going out on a date, I am with somebody's wife. Will I choose to violate someone's wife? It, it, had, me in, it had me controlling a lot of my choices when I was dating. Because it was constantly going through my mind. This is somebody's wife. And how many of you are cleaning up the mess left behind by somebody else? When you put that ring on, you thought, well, well no, it's just between us. And it's also between you and them and them and anybody that they, 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 they. When you're out on a date, you're with someone's mate. Be careful and kind. Someone has to clean up the mess left behind. Are we violating people's husbands and wives? I had to ask myself that question. While I'm dating, while I'm a young person, I'm thinking, ah. 
This passage in 1 Thessalonians outlines God's reasons behind calling us to sexual purity. He's asking his children, hey, I need you to do this. Here's why. Because you've been purified. You've been made holy. Listen to me. This is what he says. You've been purified. Now go play in the dirt. I have made you clean. I've made you pure. I have set you aside for a purpose. No, go play with mud. This is why. This is why we have to stay away from sexual immorality because sexual sin, because he said, I've cleaned you. I've cleaned you all up. I gave you a bath. I gave you new clothes. I got rid of those torn and tattered things, the ways that were leading to emptiness. You're going to go back to that? The Bible says, like a dog returns to its vomit. This guy. We are purified. We are what the Bible, some of your translations even say sanctified. That's why we avoid sexual immorality. Our old nature with its impurities, sexual and otherwise, has died. And now the new life that we live, we live by faith in the one who died for us. Right? That's what we're doing. So to continue in sexual impurity is to deny all of that. No, he never made me clean. That's why I'm still dirty. God said, that's the context. That's the context for sexual intimacy. There is no, again, that's that's not my standard. It's his standard. Therefore, it's my standard. This is the context. We're set apart by God. We're to become more and more Christ-like. If indeed, listen, he's not just Savior, but he's also Lord. Savior is, he rescued me. Lord means he's the boss. A lot of us like the fire insurance. We're just not into having anybody tell us what to do. But is he Savior? Then he must be Lord. We can't say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Do you know what that means? That I do what he tells me to do. He's the Lord. Well, no, I'd rather he just be Savior. Okay, but your life, you'll never reach abundance. I came that they might, this is what Jesus said. The one you call Savior said this about being Lord. I came that you might have life and life abundantly. I want abundant life. When we give in to sexual immorality, we're giving evidence that the fruit of the Spirit is not being produced in our lives. It's not in and through us. That's what sexual immorality does. I want to show you something. Paul gave us the fruit of the Spirit. He, he wrote out these nine fruit. And, and I, want you to, I want you to, I'm gonna put it up on the screens, and I want you to throw pornography into the text. I want you to throw pornography into the context with which we read the fruits of the Spirit. Look at this, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The Holy Spirit produces. I do not produce this. Man, this is one of my favorite hooks right here. I am so off the hook. He's doing this through me. I don't have to go, I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more kind. I'm going to be more gentle. No, the Holy Spirit's doing this. As I surrender to him, you and I, the level of fruit in our life is determined by the level of surrender to him. Again, throw pornography into the context of love, joy, Peace, pornography and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. Here's the big one, self-control. Where does pornography fit with the fruits of the Spirit? So what do we do? What do we do if, listen to me, if, if, if I'm allowing pornography to have a place in my life, even just a little bit of heroin. If I had allowed to have a place, this fruit cannot be produced because pornography is not patient. Pornography is not kind. Pornography is directly linked to sex trafficking. Every dime, every penny goes into trafficking humans. The work of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. Catch that? Fruit of the Spirit. But the works of the flesh are just up a couple verses. Look at this, verse 19, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, next one for me. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very, what? What does, 
clear mean? Easy to see. Apparent. Readily available. It's clear. Clearly. When we follow the desires of our sinful nature, it's pretty clear. The results are pretty clear. The results are right in front of you. Sexual immorality, impurity, and lustful pleasure. And the list goes on. Oh man, Paul just brings it on. And then he says, but those that follow the Spirit, he produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. When you release yourself to the Spirit, he produces this fruit. When you're in control, you produce this work. Sexual immorality, impurity, and lustful pleasure. So controlling our lusts and living sexually pure lives is essential to anyone who professes Jesus as Savior and Lord. If we say he's our Christ, that's what that means. In doing so, we honor God with our bodies. I want you to turn over, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I, w- and I want you to know, by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Th- this right here, th- this, these little things, they make these things in our Bibles. That's what this is for, right here. Okay, you're going to want to take that out right now. Just joint right there and you whoop. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because I promise you're going to want to come back to this this week. You want to take one of those little fancy strings, right? A little, so silky, right? Whoop, right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to lay it right in there. Chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Listen to this. You say, I'm allowed to do anything. You know, and I want to stop right there. You are. Let me be very clear. This is painful. Painful for me to say it in my own life when I look in the mirror and say, you can do anything you want. The grace of God covers it all. I can do anything. I can do anything and he loves me in spite of me. I can do anything and forgiveness has continued to be poured out on me. It's a scary proposition. I can do anything, but not everything's good for you. You can do that, but that's probably not very profitable. You're allowed. Listen to what he says. You say, I'm allowed to do anything. Here it is. But I must not become a slave to anything. Now listen, my context this morning is pornography. Go ahead and put your house in there. Go ahead and put your car in there. Go ahead and throw your job in there. Throw your spouse in there. Throw your kids in there. Throw your career in there. I don't know what kind of slavery exists in this room. I could go through a list of my own slavery. See, we keep track of our slavery, don't we? We know how many chains bind us. And Jesus says this, I came to set you free. Not slaves. You're slaves no more. I'm allowed to do it all, but I must not become a slave to anything. He continues on. Listen to this. You say food was made, listen to this, for the stomach and stomach for food. Obviously, right? It's true. Someday God's going to draw, do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God's going to raise us up by, uh, from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies, this is careful, your bodies are actually parts of Christ. Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a pornography, prostitute, porn, Should a man or a woman take their body and join it to porn? That's the word, porn. Prostitute, in the Greek, porn. Should a man do that? He becomes one with her and him and them. And I I can't even, again, I can't tell you. Some people have told me, oh man, oh the new season of Game of Thrones is so amazing. The storyline's amazing. That is pornography. This season, Game of Thrones, started originally in the script with bestiality. And they said, maybe that's going too far. They pulled it out. That's pornography. Clearly, that's pornography. So he says, we don't join ourselves with prostitutes because we're united in one. But the person who's joined to the Lord is one, listen to this, one spirit with him. He continues, run from sexual sin, run! Run! 
You can go ahead, write in your Bibles. Capital R, capital U, capital N, exclamation point. Run as fast as you can. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. Sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. We know what God wants from us. His will is based on his love for us. I really want this for you. I I want such freedom for you. Listen, And I struggle with this as a pastor, uh, this much, as a dad, this much, but our God, listen to this, he wants for us more than we even want for ourselves. Any, Any parents in the house know what I'm talking about when you want something for your kids more than they want it for themselves? I so want this for them, but they won't choose it. I celebrated 30 years of pastoral ministry. I've been a pastor for 30 years this year. I I celebrated that this year. And and I gotta tell you, I can't tell you how often I have wanted something more for someone than they wanted it for themselves. It's painful. And most of the times, it's it's in this area. I want so much more for your marriage. Don't you want it? I'm trying so hard. I want this for you. But it's destroying you. Because it's based on his love for us. Because he loves us. He says, oh, this is what I have for you. Put put sexual activity in this context. Put it here. And watch the, you will experience what only those who do this can. What you're experiencing right now, anybody can experience. But only people who do this can experience certain blessings. I've reserved specific blessings for people who do this. Anybody can do that. Clearly, look at our culture. We're all surprised. It is making me a little crazy, man. Side pulpit. <laughs> me too. Are we surprised at the casting couch? Since we started, it's, it's existed. And now we're going, oh, I can't believe they're doing this. You didn't think they were doing it all these years? It's always gone on. There are blessings reserved. Blessings reserved for people who put it in that context. The context God said, keep it only in this context and watch what I'll do for you. Yeah, well, I don't want to. I want to put it in this context and with her and with him and with them and I want to watch it and I want to read about it. I only get it for the articles. Remember that one? I used to say that about those magazines. I only buy it for the reading. Pornograph. The writing of. And we deceived ourselves. And now we're headlong into something really crazy by maintaining sexual purity before marriage we avoid emotional entanglements that will negatively affect future relationships and ultimately our marriage those of you who are married and have what I'm talking about you're like wow I, I, uh. here's what's happened so because there's so much mess in the middle I don't want to get involved in that mess we move to the margins and we have sex with anyone further complicating what's in the middle And so more and more people are not getting married today. They're just living in the margins, making the middle a pile that's much higher. It's making this more complicated because this is all screwed up. And so here's what happens. Then when they decide to get married, they go, whoa, there's all kinds of stuff in your life. I don't, man, you've lived with that guy, engaged with that guy, and you lived with her, and you then had sex with her and her and her all through college, and man, that's a whole mess I don't want to get involved with. The pile got bigger in the middle, and so we continue to move to the margins, making more mess in the margins and shoving it all into the middle, and we've created a mess, and pornography is at the center of this mess. One of the verses that my father, my dad, shared with me as a young man was a purity motivator for me. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, and it says this. Give honor to marriage. Remain faithful to one another in marriage. Now, this, it's, this is, is good, but I, but I want to tell you, this is not, it's not it, it, and these, again, these tools are available to you. You can, you can find a Greek lexicon, you can find the Hebrew, there's all kinds of great stuff that's out there, okay? But, but all you got to do is a little bit of digging. This word marriage, we often, in our culture, we get this, this word confused with wedding. You know, a wedding is a day, a marriage is a lifetime, okay? This word marriage in the original Greek 
And, and again, this, and it, it doesn't take a lot to dig and find this stuff. That word marriage is this word, marriage bed. That's the way I first heard this scripture. Give honor to the marriage bed and remain faithful to one another in the marriage bed. And so by God's grace, I have avoided the plague of pornography because I got that one early on in my life because I realized that every time I looked at pornography, I brought it into my marriage bed. That was gonna be a part of my marriage bed and I didn't want it because he said, I want you to be faithful to one another in your marriage bed. I want you to keep the marriage bed pure. And I said, so I, I would never invite someone else into my marriage bed, but that's what I do with pornography. And, and it helped me. For those here who are involved in pornography, God can and will, I want you to hear this, give you the victory. It's here. If you're involved in pornography and you desire freedom from it, God wants you to be free. That's his desire. He wants it for you more than you want it for yourself. He sees the havoc that's in your life, and you go, I can't get free! On your note sheets, there's just a few things that pornography affects the mind, pornography affects the heart, and pornography affects our world. But on the back of the sheet, on the back of the sheet, steps to victory. Confess your sins to God. He is faithful to forgive us. Ask the Holy Spirit to renew you. Get that, get that out. There, it just continues on. But listen, install pornography blockers on your computers. Limit television and video usage. Find another Christian who's going to pray with you and walk with you in accountability. Another scripture that just, again, helped me in my youth and I carried it into my marriage was found in the book of Job. Nobody likes to go to Job. I know. It's toward the end of Job, chapter 31. Job says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Job made a covenant. I want to encourage you again with this covenant there is an organization called Covenant Eyes. And knowing I was bringing this, this teaching, I was going to share this, I called Covenant Eyes, and I struck a deal with them. Listen, we, we struck a deal with them. They're going to partner with me so I can partner with you. Covenant Eyes is 15 bucks a month, right? And Covenant Eyes said, oh, you want to give this to your congregation? We'll give it to them for 10 bucks. 10 bucks a month. So if you go to the sanctuarychurch.com slash covenant eyes, the church gets nothing. We don't get a kickback. They're not paying us for anything. This, is not, this does nothing for me. I want something for you so badly. So covenant eyes partnered with us so we could partner with you. They said, listen to this, you sign up for covenant eyes, it goes on every device all in your home, all your phones, all your laptops, your towers, your, your uh, tablets, anything. It can go on all of your devices in your home for 10 bucks a month. 10 bucks? 10 bucks? That's like a grande latte, man. <laughs> and uh, one of those muffin sandwiches, you know, gluten free too, you know. Listen, 10, 10 bucks is what you already pay for Netflix. W why don't you? filter it. I don't want to counsel your kids. Now, if I was smart as a pastor, I wouldn't bring this whole topic up because this is job security for me. I just leave you alone to your mess and I got all kinds of counseling I can do. Trying to clean up the marriages, clean up the families, clean up the addictions that are running crazy through our families. So, we went there. Travis, are we able to pull that up on our website? Still, still not doing it. There is a button on our website, a little green button. It'll take you, and it gives you 10 bucks a month. 10 bucks a month. That's what you can do for all of your devices. And listen to me again. If you don't think it's a problem, it, it is not, it's not this little backroom thing anymore. I, I, I heard recently, I went to a men's breakfast yesterday, and they said, we're at war. Did you know that? Do you know the enemy has declared war on you? And he ain't playing games. He is launching an all-out, full-scale barrage. 
and we go, oh, I'm just, I'm really struggling in this area. Oh, I have, I'm, I'm in conflict with the enemy. No, he's at war. He will do anything to destroy you. And this is one of the ways. And it's rampant through our lives. Pornography is everywhere. And it's coming after me. I'm in the middle of trying to do a teaching. And I'll do like, a, you know, I, like, I need a picture of a boat in the water. So boat in the water. And whoop, up comes topless women on boats in waters. I'm like, what? It's coming after me. It's coming after me. He is relentless in his pursuit to destroy me. And I go, oh, you know, the enemy's just, you know. Mm. So covenant eyes is on all of my, all of, all of my work. Covenant eyes. Filters it, and listen to this. It sends out an email to the person I choose. They get to know all the internet access I have. Every website that I go on, every search engine that I look at, every word that I put in, check out this. That person, and as many people as I want, get a copy of my internet usage. Why? Because, God, I, I don't, I don't want to be in recovery anymore. I, I, want, I want to start walking forward. Instead, we're picking up pieces and just the trash left behind. I, I want to encourage you to seriously consider what pornography is doing in your life, what sexual immorality, and again, God's desire for purity. Purity is that context. That's the only one. And, and this is not what you need to be married. I'm just using that because it's a representative of what it means to be married. That's the context God gave us. Let's pray.